And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Ryan Metzler. Hey everybody, Ryan Metzler here, and today we're going to be taking a look at a little bit older game. We're going to take a look at Louis XIV, a Rudiger Dorn game. You may know him from uh, other games such as Goa, uh, but this one, uh, a little bit less known, a little bit less played. It's a two to four player game uh, about placing uh, action pawns and taking actions, obtaining crowns and other jewels and so forth, and then trading them into complete mission cards, which will give you bonus and points throughout the game. As I said, it's for two to four players, suggested ages 12 and up, uh, and takes somewhere around an hour to play. So now that we've got a basic idea of the game, let's take a look at what comes inside the box, how the game plays, and what my thoughts are on it. So here you see a four-player setup for Louis XIV, and what you can see is that there's no board to this game, but there are several tiles, and these tiles are each going to picture uh, a, a person of influence here, and then what the reward is for influencing this person the most. And the idea is that you're trying to collect different artifacts or different uh, things that you can trade in uh, to get points throughout the game for cards. And I'll explain what these, these mean here in a moment, but first let's go over those cards that I just talked about. So, at the beginning of the game, each player is going to get two cards, and these are kind of like missions that that player wants to accomplish in the game. And accomplishing, accomplishing each of these missions will get you five points and a bonus throughout the game. So you can see this one here says that you need a paper, and you need any other good, and during the supply phase, you can, you can take one money from the bank every turn. So every time during the supply phase, when it comes up, once you've completed this card, you'll get one extra money. Additionally, we have another card, and these ones are slightly harder, so you'll see the backs of these ones are light blue, uh, and they need one good and then one of any other good, whereas these darker blue ones here are going to require two different goods, uh, both of which are named. Uh, and so in this one, if you finish this one, you need one of these, uh, I don't know what it is, it looks like a, a holy hand grenade of Antioch, uh, and a piece of paper. Um, and during the supply phase, you can take any one of these three combinations. It's going to let you either get two money, a money and a little action pawn or two action pawns. So you're trying to finish these, they give you the benefits, and at the end of the game each card you finish is worth five points. And you're going to get these by placing action pawns on these different people. And you're going to do so using this green deck of cards. Uh, but one second, one more setup thing. Each round, uh, the game is going to be played over four rounds, and each round the first thing you're going to do is you're going to flip up one of these cards. And you'll see here this card here says five money. Everybody gets five money. And Louis, the king, goes on number three. And all of those tiles that I showed you, all these tiles out here, have numbers on them. And number three happens to be right here. And whoever has the most influence on that tile is not only going to get the reward from that tile, but they're also going to get a reward for influencing the tile that Louis is on. And they're going to get an extra uh, tile, which is a crown. But anyhow, uh, throughout the game, you're going to be doing several things. The first thing is that you're going to get all of that money and stuff and you're going to do the supply phase, which is one of those two cards I showed you would go off and you would take your bonuses if you had them. And then you're going to go into the influence phase and everybody's going to have five cards. Uh, and you can see these cards here all depict people that are on the tiles and they have numbers. So you'll see 11 matches this tile here, 10 would match this tile over here, 2 is going to match one of the tiles in the center, so it's this one there. We have 4 which is uh, right here, and then we have this special one, which is a wild, it's anything. Now, on your turn during the influence phase, and there's a start turn marker that passes to the left, um, you're going to be able to play one of these cards, and you're going to have to play one card, unless you have a special card that says you don't, but you're going to have to play one of these cards, and what it's going to allow you to do is either, one, play this card, and then start placing action markers, so I have the two. What the two will allow me to do is I can play the two, discarding it from my hand, uh, and then I can place up to three markers starting at the two around the board and moving to adjacent tiles. So, for example, uh, we need to start at the two. So I'm going to take my three markers from my personal supply, uh, which is down here. You can't see it, but you start with a personal supply of markers. And I would place them around. So let's say I place them here, uh, here, and here. All right, that's adjacent moving. And then the next player would take their hand. Let's say they had a hand of cards, and they want to place on six, so they discard their six. Uh, and they take guys from their personal supply, and they have to start on six, and they can place up to three guys anywhere they want. So they start on six, they're going to leave two on six, and they're going to move one here. Uh, and the next player would go, and the next player would go. 
And everyone would go until they played four of their cards, uh, four of their five. So they would have one left, and that last one would get discarded. Now, these wild cards, when you play them, only allow you to place two guys. So you could take two guys from yours and place them anywhere you wanted, however. So that's, that's kind of nice. The other alternative when you play your cards is that you may take one and discard it and take up to three guys from the general supply, which is pieces that you don't currently have, and move them to your personal supply. Now, that's not true again for the wild cards. The wild cards only allow you to take two from your general supply and move them to your personal supply. But this is going to be an important way of getting guys back so that you can use them again. And the reason you would want to get them back is because after everyone has placed their pieces, you go on to a scoring round. And scoring works as follows. We're not going to show real scoring because I haven't placed all the pieces, but let's just give you a general idea. Each of these tiles uh, will be scored at the end of a phase. And you'll see here that they each have a reward that you can get and a cost. Now, the person who has the most influence markers on this is going to get the item, the reward, for free. So in this case, whoever had the most markers would get this item for free. Everyone else who has a marker here can pay three money and get this item. Now, the benefit to paying is that you're going to get all of the markers you place back, whereas the person who gets it for free is going to lose all of their markers to the general supply. After each tile is scored, they're flipped over, and for the next round, they have a different effect. And in the next round, in this case, only the person who has the most is going to get this item, and nobody else can buy it for any money. Some of the other tiles have different ways of getting, getting rewards, and so you'll see this one here, number 10, says that if you have at least two guys on here, you can draw two of these shields, and these shields are going to be victory points at the end of the game. And there's a whole bag of shields. They're all different. They have different houses on them, and you're going to be drawing them blind, so it doesn't really matter what they are right now. But at the end of the game, you're going to get one point for each shield that you have, and then you're going to get points for having the most shields of specific types. And then after he's done, he flips over, and you can see again that only the person with the most is going to get the shields next time. So some of these are going to give you rewards related to points. For example, this one here, she gives you a crown, which is a wild good. Whereas, uh, you know, over here we have a guy who gives you paper, there's one who gives you those little hand grenade things, and there's one that gives you the rings. But there are some that give you other benefits. For example, we have number eight. And number eight's going to let you pay three money and place two guys from the general supply on number five for the next round, and take one guy from the general supply to your personal supply. So these are going to benefit you next round, whereas some of them benefit you for scoring. Anyhow, after everybody's placed their pieces and you've scored all of the, the tiles from 1 through 12, you're going to look at those quest cards that you have in your hand or these, these accomplishment cards. You're going to look at them and see if you can fulfill any of them. So if you have a paper and any other good, you can turn that in. It's going to get you this benefit for the rest of the game and five points. And if you have one of these and a paper, you can turn this in and you get that benefit for the rest of the game. And these, if you were to take them, would come from your general supply, so it's another way to get stuff back. Uh, again, whoever influences Louis' tile the most is going to get an extra crown, which is another wild for turning things in. And any time you finish one of these quests, you're going to draw another quest. And you'll see that there's three different types. There's light blue, which are easy, requiring one of any good and then one of a specific good. The blue, the uh, middle blue here, requires two different goods, and then these dark blue ones require two of the same good, but they always give you better, better uh, rewards. So in this case, you can discard any one of your cards during the influence phase, uh, which is when you're playing cards to put those tokens on, and you can place up to four influence markers from your supply onto any tile. So that's, that's really good if you get this into play, but it's still only worth five points at the end of the game. At the end of the round, you're going to start a new round, uh, again, flipping over another one of those money cards to get more money, and place Louie on whatever tile it is. And then you're going to start another influence phase until you go through four influence phases. And then at the end of the game, each player is going to score five points for each card they have. They're going to score points for each uh, three leftover money they have. They're going to score points for having these tiles, one point per tile. And if you have the most of each different tile, you get to draw more tiles to add to your points. Any leftover pieces on the board are going to be worth a point. Uh, there's these cards here that you can get through tile number 11 that lets you place things during the uh, scoring phase onto different pieces. So this one lets you place two guys from your supply or one guy from the general supply onto number 7 during the scoring phase. 
uh, so you could actually jump ahead of somebody there. But any of these that you haven't used throughout the game are going to be worth one point. And any unused influence cards, which can happen if you have extra influence cards, are going to be worth one point. So essentially, anything you have left over is worth a point. Each of these cards are worth five points, and whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. So that's Louis the Fourteenth, and I can say that I do enjoy this game. It's pretty simple. Um, it has a nice mechanic of trying to get the most guys onto a tile to get an action, or actually trying to stay underneath the most guys, so that instead of losing your action pawns, you can pay money to get the same goods. Uh, I made the mistake in my first play of trying to get everything for free by having the most guys on a tile, lost all of my guys to the center, and then had to spend several turns trying to get guys back out from the general supply into my personal supply in order to take more actions. Big mistake. You don't always want to be first in this game. And that's kind of an interesting fact. Now, the game is good for two players because it had kind of introduces a, a dummy third player that works really well. Uh, it randomly places pieces onto the board uh, and kind of forces you to work around them or to, to overcome them in order to get the benefits. Three players doesn't really work that well, and the reason is, is that since there's four rounds, each player is going to get a, to go last once, and going last is a real benefit in this game because you get to react to what everybody does. However, one person is going to get to go last twice, and that's a huge advantage. Getting to see what everybody does twice in the game and then make your own decisions really does have an effect on what you do, how well you can play, and uh, what the results of the game are going to be. Four players is really the hot spot for this game, uh, as is true for so many games, because everybody gets one round of going last, it's relatively balanced, uh, and, you know, it's just what the game seems to have been designed for. So, if you're interested in uh, the Dorn mechanic of carrying pieces along to separate or individual places, um, I think this is something you're going to like. I definitely think it has a little bit of the feeling of Goa to it, although without the, uh, the tree development or anything like that. Much simpler but definitely an interesting game. So Louis XIV, if you're a fan of that mechanic, check it out. If you haven't played anything of that mechanic, I definitely suggest at least giving one of Doran's games a try. Thanks for joining us today. For more written, audio, and video reviews, as well as the number one board game podcast, check out the website at www.thedicetower.com. Until then, this is Eric Summer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.